all of the management team, all of the board, and particularly Ross, are investors in this company. We have all bought shares in the market. We buy them in financings. And we actually invest alongside you and others who want to buy our shares, and we will make money when you do. I mean, Ross has probably put in 60 or 70 million U.S. dollars since the deal a year and a half ago. Richard Warks continued to put money in himself. Lucas Ladin's put money in. Some of the biggest names in our industry. But on the back of that, we've also then got groups like BlackRock to get invest, come in and get invested uh, recently in the, one of the financings, as well as we've refinanced our whole balance sheet. We brought in the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu, of Abu Dhabi called Mubadala. And they put in $130 million, and their goal is to work with Ross and us to create this gold mining company over the next three, four, five years. So, Christian, uh, good to see you here at the conference. Yeah, thanks very <laughs> pleasure, much. For pleasure to meet you. Um, for investors new to the story, um, could you uh, just tell some basic facts about Equinox Gold? Yeah, so Equinox Gold was formed about 18 months ago as a company. We did a three-way merger to create the company. Um, myself and a management team were involved with Luna Gold. Ross Beattie was involved with one of the other companies. And he's well known, obviously, in the resource sector. And Richard Wark was involved with the third company. We put it together. We all had the same vision. Let's create a larger, mid-tier, growing, growth-oriented mining company focused on gold while everyone else is not paying attention to gold. And I think we picked pretty good timing so far. And that was started in late 2017. And since then, we've been able to actually put together three assets. So we have a producing mine in California called Mesquite, which produces about 140,000 ounces of gold a year. And then we also have a development project in California called Castle Mountain. It's about an hour from Las Vegas. And that will produce 200,000 ounces a year once it's in full production. It's not constructed yet. And then we also have a mine in Brazil, which we've literally just poured gold on May 14th. So that's in production now. It's a similar size mine. So we now are an America's focused growth-oriented gold company. <laughs> and our goal really is by 2023 to create something that is producing up to a million ounces of gold per year. So a substantial gold mining company. And Ross has been involved with mining companies over the years, and he really wanted to build a gold mining company when everyone else hates gold. <laughs> he built Pan American Silver over about 25 years. We want to build this gold company similar to Pan Am, but over five years in total. So we want to do it quickly. And so we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we think we've caught the cycle hopefully correctly. This makes a lot of sense. So uh, I'm uh, an investor in the in the industry, and uh, it makes sense to uh, acquire projects or the companies themselves. Uh, 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 contra cyclical. So uh, you've done a great job um, so far. Uh, grown Thank to you. 760 million market cap so far. Yeah, that's a Canadian dollar market cap right yeah. now. I mean, it, the interesting part during that growth period is access to capital. Right in the last five, seven years, maybe eight years, getting access to capital to grow has been very difficult because a lot of investors have been looking to the bigger companies to shore up balance sheets, get smaller, sell assets, where it's almost contrarian to be growing, let alone to be investing in gold. So we've been doing both of those. And with Ross's financial you know, heft and power, as well as some of the followers of his, we've been able to access that capital and buy assets during that time. So it's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> and you have uh, very, very strong names attached to you, so uh, including yourself, um, which really uh, should make it easier to raise capital in a, in a difficult market. So <laughs> Easier being the operative word. It's never easy. But yeah, it's never we've, easy. We've been able to, I mean, Ross has probably put in 60 or 70 million US dollars since the deal a year and a half ago. Richard Warks continued to put money in himself. Lucas Ladin's put money in. Some of the biggest names in our industry. But on the back of that, we've also then got groups like BlackRock to get invest, come in and get invested uh, recently in the, one of the financings, as well as we've refinanced our whole balance sheet we brought in the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu, of Abu Dhabi called Mubadala. And they put in $130 million. And their goal is to work with Ross and us to create this gold mining company over the next three, four, five years. Uh, what uh, do you think uh, separates you from the, uh, the bigger mining companies? And uh, so the bigger gold companies in the space? Yeah, I mean, one obviously is size so far. So our goal is to kind of continue to close that gap in terms of size. Um, access to capital at this stage certainly has been an advantage. Um, having the pedigree and names of successful entrepreneurs and people behind it. And I think one of the most important things is all of the management team, all of the board, and particularly Ross, are investors in this company. We have all bought shares in the market. We buy them in financings. 
and we actually invest alongside you and others who want to buy our shares and we will make money when you do. It's not cheap seed shares, it's not special deals for management. Um, our goal really is to be aligned with shareholders and I think that's quite different than a lot of companies. Not just our sector but a lot of companies in a lot of sectors. Mm. Wonderful. Um, would you like to elaborate on your projects? Yeah, sure. So the first one that I got involved in was Arizona, which is a, a past producing mine in northern Brazil. It's right near the northeast coast. It's a fairly poor rural area, um, but it's a fantastic geologically. There's 2,200 square kilometers of exploration property that we have. Um, the mine had been shut down. It was on care and maintenance. It had a million ounce reserve, and we went in there and we said, there are potentially millions of ounces of gold if we can put the money into the exploration. So let's get the mine rebuilt. We put 150 million into rebuilding it. It's now pouring gold. It's now producing on a more regular basis. And we're going to go and explore again. We would like to, to believe and think that we're going to be there for decades and decades with a mine that's producing up to 140, 50,000 ounces for many, many years to come. So um, we want to also create jobs for local communities in that for many decades. That's the first one. The second one is Mesquite, which we bought from New Gold. It's a 30-year producing mine. It used to be owned by Newmont way back in the day. It's in California near the Arizona border. Um, it's had a long track record and history of producing gold. It's a heap leach mine. Um, it produces a similar amount of gold, 130, 40,000 ounces. Um, does it have as long a mine life? No, probably not, because it's been producing for so long. But there is potential, and we've been grabbing exploration concessions across the highway, and we hope to be exploring there next year to see if we can extend the mine life. Before we come to the third project, uh, maybe uh, I may ask you about the jurisdiction. So uh, California has uh, scared many investors away. Um, what's your point on this? Yeah, it's, it's always interesting talking about jurisdictions. Um, I've worked in Africa, I've worked in South America, North America, Australia. They all have their challenges. If <laughs> anyone tells you any jurisdiction is easy, it's probably kidding. Um, California's got its challenges for sure, but one of, I think, the opportunities for us is buying either mine that's in operation and already got its social license and acceptance, or the second one, which is our project, it's a past producing mine with a footprint already and a community that was supportive of the jobs and, and the mine being there. So I think it's a little easier than going in Greenfield and we're not next door to a big city like Los Angeles or San Francisco. We're literally almost on the Nevada and the Arizona border. So areas that have been poor and high unemployment too. Yeah, this is what uh, most people don't know. So uh, they, they are thinking about uh, California as a very high tech jurisdiction, but uh, the remote areas are really uh, it's desert. Th yeah, it's desert and uh, low uh, or high unemployment rates and uh, mining uh, could really uh, be good for the, the communities over there. Yeah. yeah, and one of the things that we want to do and uh, is really make a difference to our communities and in the areas that we work. And, and Roth, one of Ross's philosophies here is he's created Pan American Silver over 25 years to leave to his charities. You know, I think he's 66 years old. Um, he doesn't plan to sell that. This is his gold vehicle, which he plans to leave to his charities effectively. And he has a clean energy company as well. Um, he's leaving most of his monies to the environment and animals, to good causes. You know, he wants to make a difference. You know, it's not all about buying yachts and having fun all the time. It's about actually making a positive change as well. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, the third project? Yeah, the third project, Castle Mountain. That's in California as well almost in Nevada. It's literally butting up against the Nevada border there. And we fly into Las Vegas, drive an hour and 15 minutes. It's not hard to get people to go to do a site visit there, obviously. Um, but it's past producing. And it's interesting, and again, from your point of view um, of political risk, I guess, per se, it's a reclaimed mine that stopped mining the 2001 period when gold price hit one of its lows, about 250. And The leach pad and the area has all been reclaimed, which is really nice. You know, the animals, the vegetation that has come back. So it kind of shows what mining can do. It can put things back in its natural state. Okay, it does leave a little bit of a, a um, disturbance area on the land, but a lot of it is back into its natural state. So we're going to be able to take that land, use our current existing permits that allow us to go and reconstruct it. Really, almost no need for extra permits get it up in construction late this year so that we're pouring gold mid next year and it'll produce about 50,000 ounces of gold to start and then in a few time, few years after that we hope to get it up to pouring and producing annually about 200,000 ounces of gold and it's got a 16 year mine life so it's a big project overall. So we're pretty excited, we've got three core projects of our company. Between them they could probably produce four or 500,000 ounces of gold a year and then our goal is to hit that million mark 
and so we're going to need to buy a couple more projects. So we like to buy a couple more. This was what I was about to ask. Uh, do you want to buy more projects or uh, expand on the on the existing ones? Yeah, I mean, obviously the lowest hanging fruit and probably the, the cheapest value or the best value for every dollar we spend is on exploring around our current proje projects. So we'll do that, but also we need to buy probably two more mines at least, or projects. Um, the goal is to be probably four to six operating mines in the longer term. Um, we'd like to be focused on the Americas. I'm not saying we wouldn't go somewhere else, but because we're already there, it's probably easier to manage. And that's Ross's trap line, and his history is mostly in the Americas. Um, so we'll focus on the Americas, try to get to a million ounces, have political risk jurisdictional diversification, have multi-asset diversification. And you look at the trading multiples and evaluations that companies get that are multi-jurisdictional asset, and it does move from quite often about a half times price to NAV values up to some of them are trading at one times or above just because they've got the multi assets and that diversification. Okay, wonderful. Uh, as the CEO of Mid-Tier Gold Company, may I ask you about your opinion uh, about the uh, gold market in general? Yeah, sure. I mean, I have, a, <laughs> I have a corporate view and a personal view. My corporate view, I mean, we need to build projects that can sustain, you know, current gold prices or, or a downturn. So we try and look for good cost projects, long life projects that we, or at least that we can develop or explore into becoming long life projects. And, um, you know, not worry about the gold price per se. We want to set up a business that will see through cycles. On a personal level, I actually think we've been well placed for gold. Um, you know, in that 11, 1200 range, I thought, you know, we must be getting close to the bottom, if not the bottom. And so far, so good. It seems to have come back quite nicely. And I do believe in the next midterm here, I don't know if it's two, three, four, five years, we're going to see higher prices. I mean, you look at the main market starting to turn. You look at all the debt in the markets and all the governments using debt to finance everything they're doing. You look at interest rates being negative in many places. This can't go on forever. You know, and things like hard assets and gold will show an appreciation of value in due course, I think. And what are the key factors for gold? Is it uh, inflation, inflation expectation, uh, lowering, uh, lower interest rates, or uh, uh, maybe the US dollar correlation? What is it? Yeah, yeah, and I think those are all linked, really. They're all almost part of the same message, you know. It's, it is um, a lot of countries and companies and that are over leveraged in a sense, and so the only way out is really through either default of debt long term, Or it's through inflation, which basically is similar to default, but it's not as difficult for politicians and governments to uh, uh, to do it that way. More sneaky. Yes, yeah, it's more sneaky. Yeah. And I think the average person doesn't realize it. And I think, interesting in North America, we've never been through, probably certainly not my lifetime, any major inflationary periods. I mean, um, I think Europeans get inflation a lot better than North Americans. And I think it'll be a bit of a wake up and a surprise for North Americans one yeah, day. Yeah, but I think inflation is underestimated uh, as well. So the US dollar lost, uh, I, I think, nine. 98% of its value since uh, 100 years. So if you is, mention that it to is a, inflation. a conventional bank or a normal citizen here, people would say you're crazy by saying that, but it's just mathematics. And all paper currency does fail in the end. I think the US dollar has been a very the successful one. <laughs> and yeah. they've done a wonderful yeah. job of linking it to things like oil and that that have helped keep that as the world reserve currency. But I do think other parts of the world are creating wealth now, creating jobs, a lot of capital, and that is flowing to other parts of the world. And um, there's going to be an interesting time period here over the next five years, maybe 10 years. Uh, currently, for Equinox Gold, um, acquiring or looking to acquire new projects, do you have uh, competition a, a lot? Maybe. Uh, even from abroad, from China or somewhere? Yeah, I think the competition is starting to pick up. I, I do think two years ago it was probably less so because people couldn't get access to capital. They couldn't find money to acquire things. I think there's a few more companies now around that are talking about growth again. It almost was a dirty word during the downturn. But I think there are a couple more companies in our space in North America. Um, I'd say that Chinese groups have been around. They, it's not anything new. They've been around, but they do take time in investing in things. They tend to like large assets. And we're probably in more of that mid-tier space, so uh, we're not going necessarily for those huge tier one assets that the majors are going to buy, or the Chinese, or some of the sovereign wealth groups. But I think the majors will have some problems uh, to fill up their pipelines. So yeah, eventually, yeah. exploration companies will have uh, to rise again, and uh, the, the mid-tiers will profit. So. I think it's absolutely right. I think that's part of the thesis. You here don't have the, the pipeline problem. In due, in due course here in time, I think the major companies are going to run out of growth, their reserves are going to dwindle, and they're going to need to find growth and that's either going to come through exploration which they haven't been focused on or very good at recently or it's going to come through acquiring things and quite often that money and that capital and that focus filters down in our sector and it'll come to the mid-tiers and then it'll work its way to the exploration front and I do agree that it will come back 
in due course. Yeah, this is why I tell my, my audience, focus on the mid-tiers. Uh, <laughs> it will be uh, the best uh, growth potential right now. Yeah, and it's probably frustrating for maybe some of your subscribers at the moment because I think a lot of the money has flown into the larger caps that are more liquid. You've seen the funds being able to get their money in and out more easily and they're more comfortable. But I think it's just starting to come now where the mid-tiers are getting a bit more of an inflow. I've seen a few more generalist investors out of the U.S. and elsewhere looking at our sector, doing some homework on it, and maybe even a couple of them dipping their toes in and buying a couple of mid-tiers. And once the big money is flowing into the sector again, uh, the mid-tiers will get their attraction and eventually uh, also the smaller companies. Yeah, they will. It doesn't take a lot of money to move our sector because it is, on a global basis, pretty small. I mean, compared to oil and gas or some of the other more major resource sectors, it's uh, pretty small. And there's so much money available. So <laughs> it, <laughs> it amazes me that uh, not so much is allocated in the natural resource uh, sector at the moment, but uh, printing money is uh, what governments do right now. And uh, That's incredible. <laughs> so it, it should be going to uh, some companies uh, generating value. So. If you ask me around 2010 or 11 that we'd still be at almost zero interest rates, I mean, we're not far off that in many countries. In some, we are in negative interest rates. Ten years later, pretty much, I would have said, you're crazy. But we're there. We are there. So something's got to change. We might look for several more decades of low interest rates. Who knows? One day someone's going to want to return again. <laughs> It's positive. It will. Okay. Uh, Christian, anything else you would like to add uh, uh, concerning uh, Equinox Gold? Yeah, just um, I think it's an interesting story that's not that well known to the main markets, to uh, to a lot of investors these days. And it's something to keep an eye on because one of our goals this year really is to get some visibility. So I appreciate your time and, and taking some interest in us and we plan to list in the US at some point uh, in the second half of this year go up to the Toronto Stock Exchange we're on the TSXV right now and we'll start getting hopefully more liquidity more trading more visibility and we've already started to get it in the last 10 weeks as we've had our second mine come into production so I think we're on that growth curve to being a three mine company very soon during 2020 and I hope the visibility and the investment flow will come after that as well I wish you best of success and the gold price will make it eventually no matter what <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah.